in order to do combination therapy well, uh, one important thing is actually to use CRISPR screens. So in the drug resistance lecture, we briefly talk about CRISPR screens, but I want to kind of give you a more uh, like uh, introduction. So CRISPR-Cas9 is the bacteria immune system. Um, you're curious, you know, like human immune system is very interesting. You have, you know, it's like a U.S. Uh, defense, right? You have the Navy, you have the Army, you have the Air Force, you know, like really B cell, T cell, you know, all these different things. But bacteria is like a one cell system. How can it have an immune system? So bacteria does have an immune system, even though it's very primitive. Um, you probably remember from like high school biology, um, when you have a virus that infects a cell, the virus will insert its DNA into the cell and hijack the bacteria's or the yeah, bacteria's um, transcription, DNA replication, and also uh, translation system to package more viruses to infect other cells, right? However, if the bacteria is able to survive and kind of defend itself and get rid of the virus, it will learn to recognize this again. Um, so the way to do this is the bacteria will remember a unique piece of DNA on the, uh, from the virus. Um, let's just say this is an alien, right? This is like a, and it will keep a, a copy of that in the DNA of the bacteria. And this DNA is inserted into the police station of the, the, the bacteria DNA system. So when people were just sequencing the bacteria genome, they noticed there are some regions, they see a lot of different repeats. You know, it's like a, there's a little grid, then there's a repeat, another thing, a repeat, another thing, a repeat. And so they are wondering what this thing is. It turns out this is the police station that kept keep track of all the bad guys that has infected this bacteria from before. Okay, so um, the, 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 oh, sorry, the virus, the first virus that went in, that was the old one, that was the copy of this unique DNA. That was, then the second virus came in, it will keep, a track of, keep track of this, and the third virus came in, the fourth virus, and the newest virus is always inserted at the beginning of this repeat sequence. So you can see the order of the infection. Why is it useful? So there, this region later on will get transcribed into RNA. And then each of them is a separate. You can imagine this is kind of the police station, the, the record of what the bad guys look like, right? And they will make photocopies of this. The RNAs will be like a photocopy in some sense. And so there is a protein in the bacteria called Cas, and Cas9 is just one of these Cas. And so you can imagine Cas is the, 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 you know, the little police in the, in, the, in, the, in the bacteria. And when it goes to work, it's like, okay, I'm reporting to duty. The police station will say, go take a photo and patrol, patrol the, 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 the cell, right? So, um, and when the, the bacteria has to be very smart, the reason is it inserts the newest the virus DNA in the front is, is gonna make more photos, make higher, more RNA on the first one, a little bit lower on the second one, a little bit lower on the third one. And so the number of photocopies are different. Because you know whatever enemy that just came might come back again. The enemy that came many days before probably won't come back again. And so within the bacterial cell, there are many of these little policemen patrolling, and they carry a little photo. And the the the, the, the virus that just infected, there will be more photo of this. And so when the next time this virus come in, it will have this DNA. And the, 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 the police will see this right away. It's like, oh, look just like me, the, the, the photo. And it will go there, and if the RNA matches exactly with this DNA, it will make a double-stranded cut, and the virus will be cut into pieces. And so that's why it's called an adaptive immune system. So it has seen the bad guy before, that's why it has a photo in its police station. And then next time the virus comes, it will know to kill it. Okay, so that's the the CRISPR-Cas9 system. And so basically CRISPR is this RNA and Cas9 is this protein, right? So, uh, so Feng Zhang from the Broad Institute, it was like, oh, you know, he learned about this. Uh, so by the way, the people who discovered this is like Jennifer Doudna from uh, UC Berkeley and uh, um, 
Charpentier, Emmanuel Charpentier from uh, initially from France. I think now she's in Germany, she's from Europe. So they 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 were just looking at bacteria genome and they discovered this system. Um, and Feng Zhang discovered that he, he he found you know like read the papers like oh this is really cool. If we can introduce this to human, um, basically you introduce the bacteria protein into human and you give it a guide RNA. It's a, like a photo. Um, and so you, you can basically go anywhere. Um, so what it needs is this RNA sequence needs to match perfectly. And after the match on the target sequence, it needs to follow by a PAM is NGG sequence. And so um, the target is the same as the bacteria, the, sorry, the, the guide RNA, except that it ends with NGG. And this is also why uh, here, um, when, when the police has the photo, it only kills the virus if it doesn't kill the bacteria itself. It's because the bacteria doesn't have the NGG sequence at the end. But the virus sequence will have the, whatever sequence followed by an NGG sequence, then it will know to cut. And so basically, um, if you have the Cas9 protein, you have the guide RNA sequence that match to this, and this sequence is followed by an NGG, it will make a double-stranded cut almost anywhere you want to go. So if you want to cut somewhere in the genome, you find the NGG sequence and you design a guide sequence right before that, you will go there and cut. So anywhere you want to cut in the human genome, you can pretty much go cut. Because um, how many NGGs in the genome, do you know, roughly? What, what percentage of NGG? Uh, but it can also appear in both the plus strand and minus strand. But NGG can appear on this strand or on the other strand. So if we have complete random sequence, ACGT equal probability, it will be every eight base pair, which is very frequent. That's why you can almost cut anywhere in the genome you want to. Uh, so roughly, I would say about 10, 20 bases, you will have an NGG. Um, and so when you cut the genome, what's going to happen is, uh, first of all, the cell, is, uh, the cell knows it has a loose end because the end of chromosome are protected. There are some other things there. The cell knows these are normal ends of the DNA. But when you just have a, a DNA damage, you know, like when you have a UV cut, you know, like whatever uh, radiation, you also have double-stranded breaks. The cell will know, oh, shoot, I have some open ends there. It will just try to stitch them together. And when you stitch, um, supposedly this is the, in the middle of a gene, say on an axon region. When you try to stitch, um, the cell very often cannot make a precise stitching. So it will create small insertions and deletions and occasional, yeah, just, just change some bases in that region. And you can imagine if this is an important location on an axon, you can create a gene knockout. You know, you can have a frame shift or some important amino acid that's changed. Um, then this, the, that gene is dead. The cell is okay, but that gene will be not working very well. Okay, that's one case. The other case is if in addition to, you know, creating this double-stranded break, you also provide a template. The template on the left side look the same as the left. On the right side, it look like the right, but the middle is something different. Um, because very often, we have two copies of the chromosome. If you just have, say, radiation to create a double-stranded cut on one, usually it doesn't happen on the exact same location in the other chromosome. So if you provide the template, the cell will think that the template is the other chromosome, which is still intact. So it's going to use the template you give it to do the repair. And so the end result is that you, you can replace whatever in the original DNA with this new piece that you put in. Let's say if this is a genetic disease that just one amino acid is wrong, say the sickle cell uh, anemia is just one amino acid difference, you can use this approach, make the cut right at that amino acid around that location, provide the template with the correct sequence, then it will go in and give you the correct sequence. And, and you can also, so say, knock in a new gene in the middle of some gene desert region or something like that. You can insert new things. Um, you, and so people, I think, you know, now you go to a CRISPR genome, this is real genome editing, right? So, you know, 
people are now using it to say, uh, say, oh, human is really smart. Let's uh, the, you put some human brain gene into the mouth, uh, in, into a mouse, right? You can make a smarter mouse. Or um, in agriculture, people are trying to create uh, plants like that are more resistant to drought or some disease, right? They they can make a cow that produce more milk, or you know, they, you can you can imagine every possibility. You can also make like a Jurassic Park from lizard. Right, many, many of these you know many things, right? And that's where the money is, and that's why you know the the CRISPR patent is under so much dispute between the Broad Institute and Berkeley. Okay, it's about who discovered this first, uh, Claire. Yeah, you so, so you can imagine if you have the, uh, yeah, so it does get repaired, but then very often, so in the left side of the case, if the repair creates a mutation, then it will no longer match to your guide RNA. But if the repair is perfect, your guide RNA is still there, Cas9 is still there, it will just try to make another cut again, right? And then next time you repair, it will not work very well. Anything I repair perfectly will get a cut again. And so eventually, I think you'll get kind of a knockout of the gene. All right, so that's kind of how CRISPR work. Um, so as a computational biologist, you know, we watched this battle in 2012 and 13, you know, like not really battle at the time. It was like, oh, wow, great. It was really exciting. People can cut anywhere in the genome. It's really nice. But then if you only cut once at a time, it's not so exciting. So we waited until CRISPR um, became a high throughput assay, which is, kind of really cool. So you can imagine if you grow the cell in population, 10 to the, uh, well, like uh, hundreds of millions of cells, and in each cell, you can introduce a different guide RNA. They all, you, you all introduce Cas9, the guard is the same, but just different cells, you give it a different photo. So it will go in to, to cut different genes out, to knock out different genes. And because you knock out some genes, um, some will have negative selection, which means that gene you, you kill is very important for the cell growth. And so the, the cell will kind of grow slower if they don't have that gene. But some other cells, because you cut out another gene, it actually is growing even faster. It's very happy. Uh, the difficulty is at the end, you know, like you have all these cells growing in population, like hundreds of millions of cells. How do you know which cell cut out which, which gene? So in, we, we ask at the end for each cell to show us their photo. And that photo is only 21 nucleotide long. You can easily sequence it out. Uh, we sequence actually the DNA photo, not the, the RNA, uh, but roughly the same idea. So for example, if you want to knock out two genes, so one is the you know, Stalin gene, the other is the Washington gene. Um, remember, on this gene, you can design many different guys as we you know, Daniel mentioned, on average, roughly 10 nucleotides, you, you can design a guide. Not all of them work equally well. You know, it's, it's like, yeah, from the side, you're not sure who this guy is, right? So um, just to make sure that you're, you're cutting the correct gene, you might want to put in different photos in case they have an off-target effect or they don't work so efficiently. Um, yeah, so you try different photos. Initially, we try to put in the equal number of guides in the cell to have an even representation, right? But then, uh, let's just say Washington is very important. You know, if you cut out this gene, the cell is going to die or it doesn't grow so, so well. At the end, if you sequence, it's like, oh, what happened? The, in the final cell population, the cells that still carry the Washington photo is very few. That's an indication that this Washington gene is very, very important. So from counting the number of photos in the beginning at the end, you will know in this case, Washington is a very, very important gene. Whereas, um, just supposedly, Stalin is not very good for the cell growth, right? If it's there, the cell's not growing fast, but if you get it, get, it's like a tumor suppressor or some, some, something like that. So if you kill this gene, um, the cell is so happy, it can just not grow a lot. And so in the final cell population, the cells that carry the Stalin photo will be very abundant. And so when you sequence at the end, you see, wow, it's like, oh, I'm see seeing this same photo over and over again. That indicates the original gene is preventing the cell from growing. And so this can give you a lot of sense which gene helps the cell grow and which gene prevents. I mean, where is the gas pedal? Where is the, 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 
where is the um, the uh, break, right? So, um, so what are the th useful things you can do? So uh, you can use it to identify cancer-specific essential genes. Um, so there are some genes that are pan-lethal, you know, like, uh, it's like it's like in the body as well. Not all of our body parts are equally important. If you cut out the head, the person is definitely dead. But if you cut a finger, it's okay, right? So some genes are pan lethal. Those are not good. You want some genes that are uniquely essential in some cancer cells. That's your real potential drug target. And so recently, um, there are papers published. Uh, Brody Institute has a big paper, and I think just last week there was a Nature paper from uh, Sanger Institute. And they, they, so each of these has CRISPR screen of like 300, 500 cells. And so you can see what genes are kind of occasionally really important, but most of the time not so, so bad, right? So that's actually important. Um, also, um, you can identify um, cancer. So in the cancer cell, all the current drugs that tar in a, like a, have targeted therapy, they target oncogenes, those genes that when it's activated, well, 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 create the uh, unlimited tumor growth. But tumor suppressors are the breaks that got lost, right? So you, currently, all the drugs are targeting the gas pedal. But if you have a lost gene, it's very difficult to add it back, right? So, um, however, there are things called uh, synthetic lethality. So we, we briefly mentioned that earlier. So supposedly you have a pair of genes. If they are both good, the cell is happy. Uh, if you lost the one, supposedly this is your tumor suppressor. That's your gas pedal. Say this, this gene is like uh, lost and the, then you get a cancer, right? Uh, but say you have a drug that can inhibit the first gene. In the normal cell, it's okay because uh, if one gene is out, it's okay. And because you still have gene B there, the cell is happy. However, if you have a cancer cell, that has already had one gene mutated, and then you have a drug to target the other one, then the, the cell is very unhappy, it will die. This is the type of drug I think people really want to identify. And now a lot of efforts are invested to identify those kind of synthetic lethal pairs in the genome, where one is kind of a, you know, like a, a, some gene that you would lose, or you know, even if it's a mutation, that's okay. And then you can have another drug that targets this, this, uh, the partner. And then this will leave the normal cell intact, no toxicity, but will really kill your cancer cells. That's the real good drug, right? So you can use CRISPR screens to do this, right? So for example, you create a tumor suppressor loss, or you take cell lines that has the wild type tumor suppressor versus the cell lines that have the tumor suppressor loss, and you ask, what are the genes in terms of essential, so you do genome-wide screen, all the genes. So by the way, I forgot to mention, I'm only showing here two genes, but in reality is we are checking every gene in the genome, 20,000 genes in one experiment, which is really, really powerful, right? Um, yeah, so you can you know, do the CRISPR screens in the cells where this gene B is normal, can compare with all the cells that gene B is uh, lost, and you ask what, genes are significantly uh, important just for those uh, uh, cells where this is knockout. And that's your potential novel drug target or, or new drug, right? There are other things you could do. For example, um, supposedly this is a cancer cell that has a mutation, which normally responds to a particular drug. Um, and so you, you use CRISPR screen. So first you, you infect the cell with the CRISPR. Every cell is, you know, has a different gene knockout, and you treat the cell with the, the drug, some compound, you, you don't want to treat it with such a high concentration that most of the cell die. You want to treat the cell so that it's not so happy. You killed, say, 20, 30% of the cell, but the remaining ones are just kind of trying to stay alive. That's the right stage. You want to do the CRISPR screen. Um, and uh, you can you know, look at, like, from the early drug response and also the late drug response. Um, you can also compare the CRISPR screen when you treat the drug with the CRISPR screen without the drug treatment. And so there you can ask, you know, oh, um, 
if I knock out this gene, the cell is becoming resistant to the drug. Okay, you learn about the resistance mechanism. You also know if this gene is really uh, is knocked out, the cell is super sensitive, it will kill, uh, or even even will die even faster than, than before. And so all of these can give you, you know, it can give you, because you're testing every gene in the genome, it can tell you what is the drug really doing in the cell. You know, because every gene is being investigated, you will know, you know, which gene is really on the pathway of this drug. You know, what are the sensitive versus resistance biomarkers? Because you have genome-wide, you've invested every gene. And also this can tell you which combination of drug can make, uh, which combination of drug can make the cell even more sensitive to the first drug, which then didn't give the, that would not give the cell a chance to develop resistance. So it's a very, very powerful te technique to use, okay? Um, there are also studies, uh, so, you know, because CRISPR is really cool, people are now using CRISPR screens for um, immunotherapy or immune-related studies. Uh, there are, so the, I'm listing three different studies. The first type of study is like, uh, we know that certain can uh, cytokines can directly kill the cancer cells. If you treat the cell with, say, interferon, a lot of cancer cells will just die. And you can imagine this is like, a, so, uh, if you imagine our body as the U.S. kind of defense system, uh, T C D A the T cell will be like the the fighter plane, right? Or, or like at least Air Force. So the Air Force has, you know, they can just first of all they can bomb, right? So you can imagine if you just have cytokines, uh, you treat the cell with cytokines, like you you give the cell some bomb and see how would the cancer cell respond and what kind of gene a knockout will make the cancer cell respond better or, or worse to the cytokine treatment, right? So people, you know, this is a, a Nature paper published last year. Uh, the second type is, of course, when you have an uh, airplane, in addition to shoot, you know, like to, to drop bombs, it can also shoot guns. And um, actually that's what CDA T cells do. When they see a cancer cell, CDA T cell not only secrete cytokine, they also use porphyrin. Porphyrin is to punch holes onto the cancer cell and secrete granzyme, which is another toxic thing, into the cancer cell and make the cancer cell die, to induce the cancer cell to die. So you can also co-culture cancer cells with immune cells, like CD8 T cells. People are also doing uh, co-culture with natural killer cells or co-culture with macrophage to see how the cancer cell will respond to a killing. Right. When would it die? So, so far, this is all the CRISPR is in the cancer cells. You are checking every gene in the cancer to see whether it will respond to cytokine or it will respond to an immune. And the third type, uh, so that was published actually last year. Um, and the third type is you, you can do this in the tumor microenvironment. So you, you first grow the cancer cell in the Petri dish. You put in the different CRISPR they, they, that knock out different genes now. And you put the cancer cells in the mouse tumor, uh, in the mouse. So these mice um, are in the same strain as the original cell coming from. So you use immune competent mice. They have normal immune system. It's like an organ transplant, right? So if the blood type or whatever, everything matches, it will just take up. It's like a, a liver, but it's really a tumor in some sense, right? So you can do this in the right. So if the cancer cell and the mouse are the same strain, it can actually grow there just fine and these are immune competent mice and you wait for like two three weeks for the tumor to grow up initially put in some cells um in two weeks the tumor will grow up and you will inject the, the, the immunotherapy like pd1 to the tumor and so of course in in this mouse you will have the b cells t cell natural killer all the different units like all the u.s defense system against the the cancer and you can ask what kind of genes in the cancer cell is going to respond differently to the immune attack. You know, which one will make the tumor grow faster? Which one will make the tumor shrink? That can also give you a lot of mechanistic insight on the driver regulators of immune response or immunotherapy response. So you can see a lot of these studies getting published. Um, and recently, there is also a study um, looking at uh, the immune cells themselves. So say from somebody, you can just isolate the primary T cells. People are also doing this on T cell, like uh, T cell lymphoma cell lines, like cancer, T, T cancer cell lines. But you can also do this on the primary T cells now. Um, 
so you create a CRISPR library, you infect the library with this, uh, uh, the, so each of them only take up the photo. The thing is um, with primary T cells, if the policeman, you know, basically you have a bacteria protein there expressed all the time with high concentration, the cell is not gonna be very happy. And so what you can do is um, you use, you give it electric, you give the, uh, the T cell electric shock, you will have some little holes. So you put the Cas9 protein in there and uh, as the cell grow, the Cas9 protein will be diluted over time. It will dilute out. And so you don't have that too toxic. Because T cell, you can culture it outside the body for a little bit of time. But if you have this Cas9 there at high concentration all the time, eventually the T cell will die. It's just too toxic. But if you give it a transient dose of Cas9, and then it will, you know, it will work with the photo to make the cut, do the editing, and eventually when the cell grow up, uh, divide, the Cas9 protein will be diluted or degraded. That's okay. And so there it's asking, okay, you have the primary T cells. You, of course, you need to give it some immune stimulation like a viral infection or something, right? So, um, but here you are asking uh, what type of genes in the T cells will make the T cell activate or dysfunctional. You can, you can use cell surface marker to sort T cell for either growth or a sort for those T cells that have high pd one expression, or for, for T cells, you know, how, how, do, how do you get T cells drunk in some sense? And so these type of studies are now being conducted in all different, you know, cancer cells and different immune cells. That's just really, really powerful. So, um, um, so you know, CRISPR screen can identify, you know, novel drug targeting cancers. Um, you, you, can tar you can identify targets to treat these tumor suppressor loss tumors. You can identify now markers of drug response. You can see whether the drug is on target or off target of existing drugs. And uh, also you can identify regulators of drug resistance. You can also identify regulators of immune cell function um, and also identify novel combination therapies to overcome drug resistance. So it's a really, really powerful technique, okay?